So welcome yeah, aboard. I did say all MVPs come Tiro up. Tiro did not come up, and Tiro was awarded as an SPS MVP from Finland earlier this year. And I think, did we determine you're the only MVP from Finland? Uh, or the second? Or was it? The only, well, the only one for him. Anyway, so Tiro uh, has missed his opportunity to be famous. So, <laughs> so <laughs> one of the great things about being an MVP is this. People from Microsoft come up to you and say, I have stuff to give away. Can you give stuff away for me? So we're going to turn the floor over to you guys. And I have some prizes to give away for really good questions. But you've got this great panel of people. And some of us have spoken this weekend. And some of us have not. But here's your opportunity to ask us. And I know, uh, how many of you are SBS MVPs up here? OK, uh, Lee, what's your? Windows Expert IT Pro is the area. So uh, the vast majority, we're, we're actually two different categories, uh, SBS and Windows Expert IT Pro, uh, which is my category as well. But the fact that we are awarded in one category doesn't mean that we don't touch a plethora of other technologies. So we would love to hear from you questions about the program, about technologies, about the future of technologies, the past of technologies, whatever you'd like. Uh, we're going to throw the floor open to you. And for really great questions, I've got these really cool SanDisk Cruiser thumb drives to hand out. Can I be the runner of the mic? OK, we finally found a use for Ollie. We'll start right up front. Do we have a second mic here? No. Uh, yeah, we do. Ollie, he's right here. Yes. One, one. It's not so much of a technical question, but I'd, uh, I'd like to ask the question of the MVPs, uh, how the uh, MVP tour uh, has changed your perspective as you've gone around the country and the world and talked to uh, uh, people. Who wants, who wants to start? Tiro. Tiro. It changed his No, it's not on. All that, but nothing. You're broken. Yeah, actually, um, it got me contacted with uh, great people I uh, knew by name from uh, Microsoft, from other MVPs, people around. So, uh, yeah, it was great. And, uh, um, it was um, surprising to, to find out that the business is the uh, same all around. I mean, in the US, in Finland, Sweden, Germany, people do pretty much the same. And uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Anyone? The thing that I think that the tour did for me was, besides visiting some cities I've been to and seeing some of the same faces, that I've seen before is going to places I haven't been and seeing some of you all in your home cities and being able to show you so many new things. We showed how many new products on the tour? Four, five? Well, if you count HP stuff, I think so. You're up around uh, eight or nine. Yeah, hardware and software is a lot. And uh, we're all so jazzed up about a lot of this stuff and we wanted to share it. And that's what the tour did for us. And I really enjoyed it because when you're standing up here and you're looking at all of you, when we show some of this stuff, we can see your reactions. And we know when we're hitting home. And we know when you get it. And then the, the follow-up conversations and emails and phone calls with, with a lot of you afterwards was also, we, 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 we know you got it. You know? And it's great to be able to help you guys be successful in your businesses and in your communities. You know? We're here for you guys. So I have another question for the panel. Um, now, most of you are from the US, although we do have Canada, Germany, and Finland represented. Uh, there are different teams within Microsoft, and some of them are product teams, and some of them are marketing teams, and some of them are whatever else. Now, I have the great honor of working with the evangelism team up in Microsoft Canada. And I'm going to ask Philip not to respond to this question because there's a conflict here <laughs> that we'll discuss privately. But do you guys have 
and within your regions, contacts with, within Microsoft that have, that have called upon you, said, hey, you're an MVP, we need help getting out the message. And if so, how has it helped you? And if not, um, what have you done or what do you think you can do to make that right and get more involved with Microsoft themselves? Ollie, I know you work with the DP team in Germany. Why don't you? Well, do yeah, I, w I just want to jump up in front uh, as I used to do normally. Uh, yeah, I got, I got this, uh, I got pretty interesting experiences with folks from Microsoft Germany, and uh, actually, um, uh, it seems to that I, it seems to be that I have a pretty good reputation right now inside Microsoft Germany to know SBS and those SMB stuff things. So it seems to be. Um, the on-job training for the new SPS product manager in Germany to have a, a to-do list, which would be number point number one, call Oli. <laughs> and let him give you the two hours introduction into SPS and how that product works and what you should do about it and how you should market it and whatever it works in Germany. And this. So everything I know about the, la the last five or six um, product managers before they even were even announced publicly to be the product managers because they called me. Which is cool, because that again helps me then, because I help them, they help me and give me uh, smaller jobs for, for uh, doing presentations in, uh, as, as a Microsoft uh, consultant and stuff, um, which is great. And you know, and I, other than that, you know, I, I have, some, uh, have so many things going on, just go, jumping in here to help me out. <laughs> This question about being asked by Microsoft to go out and do things. Um, I, I would like to suggest that that's probably not characterizing the most common nature of our experience. It, it's actually kind of rare that Microsoft actually asks us to go out and do things if you keep it into the context of what your perception is. I mean, we, we have monthly calls or, or with them about various different things. And during the course of the call, somebody who is on the call from Microsoft is say, uh, yeah, we got a fix for that out. We really help uh, appreciate if you could help us, you know, let people know that 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 fix is out there and that they can they can get it. That we don't get asked to, you know, the the sales really on uh, essentials are down right now. So we're really hoping that everybody would go out and put out a blog post on essentials and help us sell some more essentials because that's not the nature of the relationship. Now. At this point, I'm going to 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 do something that is a little bit controversial. Because I tried, I tried to just uh, um, characterize to you that some people might perceive that Microsoft expects the MVPs to go out and market the product. And that's generally not true. And the Community Roadshow that was done in 2011, uh, clearly there would be uh, the perception that the MVPs were out marketing the product. Uh, I think for us, we felt like we were marketing the solution. And if the product had to be bought to get the solution, then I guess that was implicit. So yeah, we did kind of go out and market the product. But I want to make sure that it's understood that it wasn't that Microsoft came up with the idea for those products. The MVPs chose the products. Uh, Microsoft didn't come up with the idea of how the presentations would be assembled to try and communicate what the logic was in the integration. The MVPs came up with that. Uh, the, the goals of the event were intended to simply uh, go out and do an outreach to empower community to empower us and to empower the community to be consuming things. Now, the controversial thing that I'm going to say is that we went out on the road show last year unaware of what's happened this year. We did not know what was coming. We did not know the turn of events. When we went out and told everybody that this is the great time to be an IT consultant in this space, and the opportunity to sell all of these great products that can fit into the various different slots. Everything we said was sincere, was exactly what we believed, and exactly what we would have been doing if we were not out there talking. We'd been out there doing the same work as everybody else, and that's what we'd be selling. Sometime around the time of the ending of the roadshow at the end of last year, Microsoft did something that is rather in contrast to the experience that I have and that a lot of us have. And uh, I suspect if anybody disagrees with me, they're welcome to have the mic and argue the other point. Microsoft stopped talking to the MVPs. 
When I say they stopped talking, I don't mean that there was no conversation. I mean that they stopped communicating to us the kind of things that would allow us to see over the horizon and to help communicate over the horizon kind of information or to assess what they were doing. And I would, uh, would say that the MVPs in general who are here, I think I know enough of an opinion about everybody here, that the MVPs did not really agree with what Microsoft was proposing to do and we also didn't know many of the things that they were expecting to do. And to that extent, when you, when you talk about the idea, did Microsoft ask us to do anything about this? You know, basically Microsoft began to pretty much ignore communication to us and or to us intended to go to you. So when everything went dark in 2012 and you only heard things out from Microsoft messaging, that was Microsoft's choice. That was not our choice. And when you didn't hear clarifications from us when information started coming out, it's basically because a lot of the information that you were getting, we were getting it at the same time on the same public press release. We were in no different situation than you were. I can say that we knew that SBS was going to have a retirement date announced. We didn't know when it was going to be announced, but we're, we're not foolish. We, we realized WPC was probably when it would happen. We didn't know what the pricing changes would be. We didn't know the licensing changes until so late in the process that there wasn't any way that even if we wanted to try and communicate what was going on. Basically what I'm telling you is that Microsoft has moved the line on where they consider MVPs sit in this space. And we are more outside the fence at this time than we have ever been. In the entire time I have been an MVP, I have never felt such a dull ear from Microsoft. They're not listening to us. They're not acting on things we're telling us. They're not telling us things. We feel like you do. We felt a lot like you do. And now I'd like to ask if anybody would like to either say something contrary to that or clarify it further. And we also have a question in the back and two up front. So you sure. have your question, sir? Build on what you said, if that's the case, then I guess where do you guys, because everybody in this room kind of looked to the MVPs as far as uh, maybe some direction and, and that kind of thing. I don't know if you know this or not, but where do you see your relationship with Microsoft going forward? How, do, how does your role change? So, I'm actually going to wrap up a previous question and try to put them both in a nice ball. Um, I got my MVP. Uh, I kind of fell into it. Uh, I'm from Montana. Montana is very rural as an entire state. We're a country unto ourselves. <laughs> it means that even in the heyday of Microsoft's communication, uh, we heard about this thing called TS2. And we heard that there were buses with technology that would go and visit people. And they just avoided Montana. Montana didn't see Microsoft. Yeah, and, and this was when Microsoft was spending plenty of money going to bizarre places. We would hear that they went to a 10,000 population town in South Dakota. Not a 10,000 population state. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's Montana. It's not Egypt, I mean, come on. You know, I, they, they just, for whatever reason, they avoided Montana. They, we, were, we were almost as bad as Wyoming when it comes to the map. I <laughs> never figured it out. So I was used to being passionate about technology because it solved problems. It was a solution. It was a way to achieve a greater goal, regardless of what that was. Apparently, at some point, that got somebody's attention. I got this email. I, again, I was about the technology. I wasn't about the recognition, and I was just one lone voice way out in the middle of nowhere. So I get this email about this award. I say, sure, why not? Uh, six months later, I get a box on the doorstep. I had forgotten about it. And there's this award package and an NDA, which, okay. Signed that, and suddenly this whole new world opened up to me. And um, 
but that meant a lot. That meant that the effort I was putting in was recognized, but I was never gunning for that award. Now that Microsoft, and I didn't forget the question, I'm bringing it back around. Now that Microsoft is pulling back, um, my role hasn't changed. For me, the importance is building the right solution to empower the business, to empower the nonprofit, to better the community, whether that's a technical community, whether that's a virtual community, whether that's the town you live in, that's what's important to me. That's what made me an MVP in the first place. And I would say that's probably what made most of these people's MVPs was their passion about something greater than themselves and greater than a single company. And that's the way my relationship is going to continue to be from moving forward. If Microsoft wants to move that line, that's their choice. I'm a resource that they may or may not choose to use, and I may not offer every resource they wish they could from me. But as long as I can collaborate with them to build a better solution, I'm going to continue to do so. And if they choose not to engage in that process, I may continue to try, or I may choose to engage somewhere else. But for me, the passion is about the end game, not a particular particular loyalty to a person or brand. I hope that makes sense. So who's got the, uh, this gentleman over here? You want to bring in the... Um, sure. <laughs> Cliff and I work together. I walk the mics, he stands and tries to knock, knock over things. <laughs> yeah, a couple comments on that. One is, as a Microsoft partner, we were hearing a lot of the, the same things too. And I've talked to a couple of the MVPs and Nobody in this room knows that or thinks that you all were holding out on us. Everybody agree on that? So <clears throat> Microsoft's taking a step back. We still depend on you guys to help give us some direction, to help us figure out where are we going to migrate from here to help us plan for our clients and also figure out how are we going to get out of this mess when we're going to talk, talk to these clients and say, oh, by the way, your next migration is going to cost you three times what it should have cost. So we're going to be looking for your help to figure out the best way to migrate them to the next platform, whether that's Exchange 2013, Office 365, or in two years, who knows what the heck's going to be out there. So that's pretty much all I've got for it. So by the way, let me give my perspective because of us, I'm the one guy who works for Microsoft and is an MVP, which is really not supposed to happen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, Ollie as well. Um, sometime, by the, first of all, I should mention that there are 120 odd product groups that have MVPs associated with them or more. And when we talk about the SBS team uh, losing contact, it's, it was specific to that group. Some groups have more, some groups have less. Um, Lee and I will attest that when we were when we started asking questions about Windows 8, because that's our product field, we were told by our lead that, you know, over the last few years, we've uh, noticed that there have been a lot of leaks from the MVP, and we love the MVPs, and sometimes there, if you've got 200 MVPs in a category, one person gets information and shares it when he's not supposed to, and that can spoil it for the, for the whole batch. And believe me, I, I had a close call. I nearly lost my MVP this year when I accidentally uh, leaked something that I was allowed to have and I was allowed to talk about, but I, somebody made a point of, of why him and not me. And it's, it's dangerous to say Microsoft has this community of MVPs that they will always trust and they will always love. Microsoft always loves their MVPs and they, we always give them uh, feedback. But sometimes that feedback isn't in line with what they think, and we are 4,000 MVPs worldwide, more or less. Four and a half thousand, 4,500. Uh, we're not the only ones out there, and it's hard for us to, to, to accept that sometimes. And we've had some fights with them that I think some of them we should have won, and some of them we should have lost. Just a comment. Um, I'm a business owner. My wife and I own our, our own IT company. We've been at it for about 10 years. Obviously, SBS has been a bit of a, a mainstay for us. Uh, on the MVP side, yeah, it's been great. It was a recognition. Okay, that's all fine and dandy. Now, here I am and my wife. We've got a business to run. 
I got inside information that I have no clue whether I'm allowed to share it or not. As Mitch mentions, I'm in a dilemma. We're all in a dilemma. You all are in a dilemma. And what the chicken do I have to say about it? I had to be almost completely quiet until things started to get out in public and we we're given permission to say things. So for some of us, can you imagine the struggles that we've had not being able to say anything with what little we did know? Because that fence has moved quite far compared to the way it was uh, many years ago. Imagine, imagine the struggles of, oh crap, can I say this? Can't I say this? Um, hmm, shoot, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go anywhere with it. So when the, when the release happened and we were able to start talking about all this stuff, we're, now we're sitting here going, okay, um, what exactly do we have to say? Because we're, we're, we're in the same boat. We're, we're not 100% sure on where we're going. Tomorrow, we're going to have a conversation uh, at the end of the day. I know I'm competing with Harry, but um, please do come in. We're going we're gonna to have a pretty good conversation. Um, and I'll share a lot more with you about the struggles that we've had about our business, which I'm guaranteeing based on what I've seen over this last couple of days that all you all are, are struggling with as well. And, and we'll talk about what direction we can go in and how we can live going forward. I want to address uh, something that you mentioned real quick. Um, the, the, in, in what, what, what we're saying here is that you may be accustomed to a lot of uh, communication that comes from us that is informed by insight that Microsoft gives us that you can't find on the street. Uh, you, know, you may be thinking of us as the pig that's going to find the truffle because we were given the map. Okay, so what I'm telling you is that uh, we, as in the SPS product line, we used to get more trust, we used to get more information, and we used to be given information to put out. It was very much like the small business lifestyle of, of a more personal kind of thing. Microsoft has pulled back to a much more corporate style, and that's impacted us as a, a, a whiplash because last year we went out and did something extraordinary and then got pulled all the way back to where we are. Now, the thing I wanted to address about what you were saying is that you said, I'm going to have to go to my customer and say that this migration or this upgrade or this new product is going to cost four times as much of what it should cost. Okay, I don't think that's what I would tell your customer. <laughs> there is no what it should cost. <coughs> I mean, we've been frustrated, but taking your frustration back to your customer and saying this migration shouldn't cost this much or this product shouldn't cost this much is not going to change the reality of that that's what it is. You know, for those of you who know about my history with Katrina, I said in that first year that I went out on tour, that uh, I always said, you know, if the levees break in New Orleans, you know, it really won't matter because if it's all gone, then it's all gone. And then, lo and behold, the levees break, everything gets wiped out on that, you wake up the next morning, you know what, turns out it matters. Because you don't walk away. You actually go back and you deal with the disaster that has occurred when it's a disaster. Okay, well, here's the disaster. The market is changing. Microsoft is changing. Where we're going is changing, how we're going to get there, and what we're going to do along the way. That's all changing. And when you look at the front of the room and you think, okay, well, the MVPs have got the inside word to help move you in that direction. Well, you know what? We may have some experience in trying to read the tea leaves that goes a little further than what you have. But we're all kind of in the same boat now. We're all having to deal with the same sort of sense of you're going to have to trust your instincts about what's good for you, what's good for your customer, what you believe in in the marketplace. Because I'm telling you that you're not going to be getting the kind of direction coming out of Microsoft or coming out of us that you may have been accustomed to over the last 10 years because that is part of what is changing. So we've had a question in the back for the last 15 minutes and I'm going to give him the last USB thumb drive because he's been very patient. By the way, just Ollie, that's what a runner does. Thanks. Thanks. I've got an actual kind of pick the MVP's brain kind of question uh, regarding Office 365. And I couldn't get a really clear answer on this from Microsoft, so maybe you guys have some backdoor knowledge on this. But I was examining a couple of client scenarios, of course, in the you know in this whole light of 20, uh, the 2011, the end of SPS and all that stuff. Anyways, Office 365, <coughs> the Microsoft Office 2010 professional, whatever, within Office 365, now sort of officially the cheapest way to get Office out to the clients, doesn't run in terminal server environment comes up, you know, wrong license model because it's uh, it's not volume, it's the other the other model. 
Ask Microsoft about that. Yep, not supported. And end of the story. Now, you know, do you guys have an inside track on whether Office 365 deployments are going to be supported in terminal services, remote desktop environments? So, first of all, that's an, even if you weren't waiting for 15 minutes, that's an excellent question. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate everyone for knowing Office 365. The other day, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, we got an, or Thursday, we got an announcement that Office 2013 uh, code was, was closed and released to manufacturing. Yes. That was Thursday. It was Thursday? Yeah. All right. So we have. And exchange. Uh, not relevant, but okay. Uh, <laughs> and SharePoint too. Okay. Boom. Bang. Uh, well, I'm finishing the because he's asking about in terminal server, and that's what's. By the way, it's not a terminal server anymore; it's remote desktop. But that couldn't be less important to the uh, question. Okay, um, a lot of the licensing models for this are changing with 2013, and as soon as the there's there's a, there's a unclear delineation between RTM, the day that the code is released, and oh, it's done, it's ready, we're all ready, and then we get it, not the day that at RTM, but the day that's called GA, or general availability. When GA for Office 2013 comes out, Office, two th uh, Office 365, excuse me, is going to start getting upgrades, and a lot of the licensing models are going to be changing. And I can't address today what those uh, licensing changes are going to be for two reasons. First of all, I don't think they're completely decided. Second of all, I'm not a licensing expert. I'm not actually allowed to. But look for some really exciting and interesting and relevant licensing changes to come uh, in the first quarter of 2013. You're next, uh, then you, then you. Uh, question about the direction going, going forward. Kind of curious to see what you guys might be, be thinking. I know Ollie was talking in the last presentation about using essentials in some ways that you could use essentials going forward. Uh, and David presented uh, the other day, but right, having been with SBS since version 4.0 back in the mid 90s, I've seen products go into the suite, products come out of the suite, licensing changes and coming, as I was on the airplane coming here, I was kind of thinking to myself, I don't wanna use essentials. I should just choose standard because there'll always be a Windows Server standard and they won't uh, bundle in this or, bu or bundle in that. Will there always be an enterprise? Well, uh, I'm just, I, I was curious your, your thoughts on, do you have any hesitation to start using essentials for fear that in two years or three years that won't be here the way EBS isn't here anymore? And any leaning toward standard just to standardize or I'm kind of conflicted with what to do? The thing is, is <laughs> no matter what you, you choose, you need to choose, and this is, this is the most important thing in your business, you need to choose what's right for your customer. You, you need to absolutely choose what's right for your customer. And just because it's right today, it might not be right tomorrow, but you're making a decision based on the most upfront information that you have at the time. You're making an information or a, a choice based on the information that you have and the knowledge that's available to you and what you know from previous experience. Um, if you have a, a customer that has 10 users, um, they've had 10 users for 10 years, and most likely when you ask the, uh, the business decision maker in that business, if they're gonna have any more users in the next 10 years, and they say, nope, we're gonna have 10 users in the next 10 years, then why wouldn't you go with Essentials? It is the, the cheapest and most current solution. It's gonna be supported for five years throughout, you know, with, with product supports and stuff. Why would you go to a more expensive solution because you're afraid something's gonna happen to the product group? It, you don't know that it's gonna happen in, in previous experience. Yes, 2011 went away, but it's also still a very valid product. It's still for sale and it's still gonna be supported through 2016 or some random number like that. Um, it, it doesn't scare any of us away, I don't think. Yeah, it's, it's not five years, it's I think nine years. It, it's, it's so far out that, you know, so you got to make, there, there never is a right decision. There's only a decision that you can make based on the knowledge that you have at the time. 
And I, I mean, I hope that answers your question. I, I'm going to add to that while I bring the mic over to Ofer. Um, traditionally, those of you who say you got screwed when your product went away did really well from Microsoft. Hey, we're not going to support EBS anymore. Here's three full versions of Windows Server. Here's Exchange Server, here's System Center Essentials, and here's uh, Exchange. By the way, two licenses of it for the front end and the back end. Um, that's a really, really nice golden parachute. Uh, response point. There's, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> he, he's an evangelist. He doesn't have to be familiar with that. I have a two-part question. Um, the engine of, of employment in this country is small business. And yet, from our perception, and I'm not sure if this is the MVP's uh, perception, it seems like Microsoft is making it more difficult for small business to operate with small business choices. So my first question is, do you agree with that premise? Uh, as part of this thing, you're saying that they're moving the fence, moving the line, and so on and so forth. And the second part is, do you think other vendors, IBM, Lotus, and so on, are going to now all of a sudden invade this space? Boy, there are advantages to having the mic control. Um, first of all, I'm going to disagree with the premise of your, of your statement. I agree with a lot of it. I think that there is a vast number of small businesses in this country. But if you look at our, and I'm going to put my Microsoft hat on for a moment, if you look at our... Uh, bottom line, enterprise makes a lot more money than small business, and it's not even close. So for, for you to say, well, Microsoft is making a mistake, Microsoft is a corporation with stockholders and board of directors, and they have to make decisions. Yes, they've got to make great technical decisions, and I think that finally, I mean, I'm so proud to be a member of Microsoft now, whereas five years ago, people were always saying, you're evil! Uh, so, I, but on the other hand, I don't think that they're making it harder for small businesses to do business as small business. They're evolving the way small businesses are going to do business. And yet, what happened to that part about people who haven't answered the question? <laughs> <laughs> they're evolving the way small businesses are going to do business. And it's going to be painful. But in the end, it's going to be more. It's going to be better off for the small businesses. Amy. <laughs> uh, apparently, I looked like I wanted to answer this question. No, you, have, you have a perspective on this one. Um, Microsoft has a different vision of small business than we all have. No, it was me. It's Mitch. So uh, Microsoft's what? vision, and I don't and. They've changed, they've changed their mind about what is appropriate for a small business. We don't have to change our minds about what is appropriate for a small business just because Microsoft changes their mind. But I also don't, I believe that the other vendors in the space are not going to rush in and save the day and create something like SBS for us, us all to start suddenly selling. What was that load, load server called? Yeah. I think that the industry as a whole believes that small business domino server that they the whole small business sector behaves like consumers and therefore we're going to treat them like consumers i don't think that there's any major player out there that believes anything different we know different because we're on the ground working in those small businesses and I believe, as you do, that the small business is the engine of the entire U.S. economy. We're the only sector that actually creates jobs. Um, so, so what are we going to do? So if the product is changing with small business server and going away and we're left with the server, um, the straight server product itself or the essential server, which doesn't have the features that your customers have been using, you have to kind of go with the flow. You either have to build your own solution from the standard product or modify the essentials server solution, go with the cloud, 
or a hybrid solution of both. I think there's going to be plenty of room for a hybrid solution for as far as I can see going forward, which is probably another 10 years. I think that that hybrid solution remains in place during that period. Amy, I want to ask you another question that, uh, that uh, pertains to Ophir's second part of the question. Are the other vendors going to step in? Um, such as, did you, you mentioned Google and one other. Okay, well, IBM, I've addressed. IBM used to make good, good. All, they still make great hardware, but unfortunately, uh, I, w I actually met with the guys who were the guy, the people who developed Domino Server, and I was all excited to work with them, and I was all excited to start uh, playing with it and everything. And then it went away; it stopped being. As for the Google side of things, you you're saying that uh, that is are, is Google going to step in? Google did step in, and for two years, people were saying, wow, I should be using Google Apps instead of this. Well, Microsoft actually adapted and is looking a lot more like Google Apps on free and paid solutions with the SkyDrive uh, web apps and the Office 365. And it's kind of hard to win when we, we answer the market as they asked for and then get asked, well, why did we change? But it's going to be an interesting space. I think there is a need for an on-premise small business server type product, but it's going to have to have a cloud engine to it as well. I have a question for the audience. How many of you think SPS is dead? Show of hands, please. Okay. It's not dead. <laughs> How many of you know what SPS 2011 Essentials is? Compare its features to the new SPS which is now called Windows Server Essentials 2012. You will see an identical situation. What's a little bit different is the name. So the problem I'm having, because I do a lot of my <coughs> support of your community in the Spiceworks forums, is people are popping in, not reading anything that's been posted, and they're popping in saying, hey, what do I do? SPS is dead. And it's getting really annoying. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we had a question up front here. Uh, was it you, sir? It was you. Okay. And then we're going to come back to you, and then we'll ask for a few more. I'm probably the least technical person here. Uh, mostly, boy, you guys are geniuses compared to me. But I'd like to take the question in a different direction. I've always uh, appreciated all of the knowledge that came from you folks, and I can see where they're trying to protect uh, pre, you know, early announcements on stuff. But I've always figured that Microsoft would be looking for your input to figure out what does the communities really need. And I have a concern when they're not listening. I think I know what happened to Small Business Server. Microsoft has decided that they want everything in the cloud and it's not moving fast enough. And I think the reason they got rid of Small Business Server was to get rid of the exchange part of it and make it more difficult so that they can push all of that stuff into the cloud. But I would like to know, what I would really like to know is, do you see anything changing where they're going to start listening to you? Because if not, they may lose to somebody like a Google. Uh, I'm going to let someone else answer the question, but I just had this flashback to a meeting that we had where Charlie Russell nearly burst a blood vessel in his neck when this was first proposed several years ago. You were at that meeting, too. Uh, who, who wants to take that one? I'm going to start it, and then I'm going to pass on if anybody else wants it. Um, I, I'm, I want to, first of all, uh, make a statement which kind of now goes contrary to the other controversial statement I made earlier. Okay, I'm, I'm going to defend... Um, a substantial population of Microsoft, also known as employees of Microsoft. In my experience, Microsoft doesn't do what you just described. They don't decide to pull that product out because people aren't moving fast enough to the cloud. I don't actually find uh, Microsoft uh, staff to think that way. I don't find that their products designs are necessarily intended to, to think that way. I think what happens is you get unintended consequences. The unintended consequence is that Microsoft sees its overall survival as threatened by its world position 
vis-a-vis -vis Google going after its enterprise customers or Google going after its consumer space. And Microsoft can't afford to try and tune every single market segment to the best way they could if they could devote 100% of their engineering to a specific segment. And so the end result that you get is that the reason that Exchange got harder to, to manage and edit in 2008, uh, 2010 timeframe, what we knew for the SBS products, is because it wasn't being designed for our space, it was being designed for where it was going. And it was going that way in enterprise, and those designs were being implemented so that it could make the step up to go into the cloud services, but we just didn't know that. So a lot of illogical things happen that we try and interpret why it's about punishing us, and it's about we're just not that important to the design of that product. The product has to get someplace. And Microsoft feels that it's worth losing market position in traditional markets that have to be thrown out in order to get to the market position they want to be in cloud for them as a whole, not because of us. Uh, before Amy takes over, I want to add one more thing to that. Uh, for those of you who think there, there's a technological reason why this happened, First of all, it has nothing to do with the SBS team. SBS is a team that has traditionally written wizards, and the reality is in uh, Exchange Server 2010 and 2013, they cannot be. It's not that it's a best practice not to. They cannot be installed on a domain controller. So there's your reason right there. But I want a show of hands. How many of you think that your SBS Exchange servers are secured? Wow. I'm very surprised that only two of you are wrong. Uh, there, in order to secure an Exchange server, in, in order to manage an Exchange server, and I'm going to put my Microsoft hat aside for a minute, I'm going to say this as an MVP who's an opinionated uh, person, you have to have an MCITP in Messaging and Administration and a CISSP to, to secure an Exchange server. And there's no exception to that. You're not secure. Most of you are using third-party tools like OwnWebNow or whoever else to add a layer of security, but you're still not even close to secure. And now it's more important than ever to secure your environment, especially your mail. So um, over the years of being an MVP, I've had many conversations with um, developers and the marketing people in small business uh, on Microsoft's side. And one of the things that they have asked repeatedly, I'm mean, trying to remember how many years I've been an MVP, seven or eight or nine or something. And every time I would see them, they would say, how do we get you to support more small businesses? And every year we go to a thing called MVP Summit and Microsoft puts the same slide up on the, up on the board every year and it shows 145, small 145 million small businesses and three million copies of small business server. How do we get from three to 145? And so what they tried was creating the SBSC program to, to try to educate, to get you to be able to see each person in this room to be able to support more. And so one of their goals is always to increase the number of customers per IT person. So if I can go, and we know, right, each IT professional, if I'm supporting those by myself, I can handle about 25. And that really has not changed, and it hasn't budged, even though from 2000 to 2003 to 2008 to 2011, still support about 25 customers each. Until you add the cloud stuff into that. And they take away some of that management from, from us and put it into the cloud. And you'll see in Microsoft's messaging that if you look, what they're saying is you can now support 3,000 customers because we're going to do all of the maintenance for you and you just have to get out there and sell it. And you can now have 3,000 customers instead of 25 customers. And that's what Microsoft wants. They want each of you to get out there and have more customers. And the way that they think that they can empower you to do that is for you to sell to the cloud. That's where their motivation is. It has nothing to do with what they think small business is, you know, where they're going or small business server, is it good, is it bad, whatever. It's all about more Microsoft products to more businesses. So we have 
So, uh, somebody yelled out, was that a comment or another question? Uh, we'll, we'll disagree with that statement, but this isn't the session for it. Phil? Just a comment on uh, exchange. I, part of this whole process of what's happening and where we're going and all of that, well, we've started to set aside, we've got a little slush fund, put a little bit of money every month away ju for just in case. It's something my grandma told me, something I've stuck with throughout the, in the last 10 years in our business. So we have a little bit of money here and there. It's one of the reasons why I'm here. I went to Mech in Orlando, Florida uh, just a few weeks ago to spend uh, the full three days at the, the first Microsoft Exchange conference in 10 years. And what I saw in Exchange 2013 is going to be good for us. It's going to be good for us. I got to work firsthand with the administration center, the new way of managing the new Exchange, Exchange 2013. And while it's web driven underneath it all, it's all GUI based. We're, we're coming back and it's simple. It's easy. And anybody who likes to do things consistently keeps a checklist. It's set up like a checklist, just like the getting started tasks have been in SBS for many years. Okay, I'm going to be a little biased here. I've been in SBS MVP for what, four years? Um, let's see, the new direct access was uh, in, in 2012. It's wizard driven. The new structure in Exchange Administration Center is getting started tasks driven. It's structured in a very similar way with very similar wizards. Um, while we kind of talk about the death of SBS, uh-uh. The stepchild, as some may, folks may have called it, but it's real, it really isn't, has worked its way backwards. It's gone into the other product groups. Product groups. They've watched us in the last 10 years configure a server in however many minutes. Well, SBS 2011 was a little bit of a beast on that side of things. But once we were done as a group, us as a community, we had the same server installed at 25, 50, 100 sites. And it was set up consistent if we used the wizards. But if it was consistent across the board, you don't get that in enterprise. Everybody has their own way of doing things. Enter PowerShell. Um, well, even with PowerShell, folks have different ways of doing things. We have a consistent vision through and from Microsoft in Small Business Server that ha gives us the platform we need going forward. Just look very carefully at all the new products that are coming down the pipe. And there are lots and lots of little hints of Small Business Server in those products. Lots of them. So we have time for one last question, and I apologize to anyone who didn't have a chance. This gentleman's been very, waiting very patiently, and for all of the rest of you who had your hands up, uh, Ollie's gonna buy you drinks tonight. <laughs> so just go see him. This is really uh, an observation ending in a question. Um, I started my business back in 1990, and that was back, in, and I've talked to a couple of people about this, when you had to know what a lot of vendors supplied, but it was easy because you read it in magazines. The, the, the pace of change of technology was very slow. And so there was a time when I had to support, uh, you know, Macs as well as, as whatever Microsoft was pushing and Banyan Vines and Novell and all the rest of these things. Well, Microsoft came along and made my business model simple. And so I went through the past 10 years just upgrading my clients from one SBS to the next, and, the, and everything was fine. So I got very upset when I found out, just like the rest of you guys did, that I felt like all of a sudden Microsoft had become Apple and said, there's one way to do things, and it's our way, and you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Fine, that was my first reaction. Then I started to get upset that says, now I'm going to have to spend time evaluating what's really best for my clients, which may include additional vendors. I was upset when, I, when they took ISA out of 2003 because now I had to go out and get a favored firewall vendor. And I, so I started sitting back and saying, we've got to start as my business now, investing time and money and effort into really determining what mix is best for my client. I didn't have IBM, sta I mean, um, Microsoft standing there saying, here, this is the next best step for you with your clients. And I had become accustomed to just following down the road, making the money, not investing. Well, I feel now my business has to invest. But I'm starting to hear a little bit that says, well, maybe I can 
sit here and listen a lot to what they have to say, but I'm still going to have to be, you know, a little more agile than I used to be and invest some more overhead, lose some profit, supplying the same basic market. I'm not going to go out after three, I'm from Vermont, so wherever Montana is, you know, we probably have fewer people than you. Uh, it's a, we're a, you a don't, but I've spoken at 17 user group events in Vermont and New Hampshire. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, but we're the size of a county in Montana. Um, so I can't get 3,000 clients. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've got, uh, actually went down 10,000 last year, which is a big deal. Anyhow, um, and so it's really that paradigm shift that I'm more upset than anything about is I got, I felt like as, a, as my, the owner of my business, I got kicked in the teeth, and now I've got to go back and start really spending a lot more time. And if, yeah, I knew Office 365 was there, but my clients didn't want it. It was fine. Now I've really got to determine, is that what I want to do? What are my choices? How am I going to have to go? Are, and I can't rely on Microsoft to help with that roadmap yet. They're not talking about it. They had a good chance to talk about it first thing yesterday morning. They had to get another, uh, they didn't even talk about it themselves. They had to get one of, uh, you know, a business owner up there and say how wonderful all this change is going to be. I wish they had taken the opportunity. I remember the days when this conference used to be at the Microsoft campus. Well, it's not, and it's not going that direction. And so I don't know whether Microsoft cares about our space or not. I, I really don't know at this point, but I'm going to have to spend time and money and effort finding out. And that's something I'm not sure MVPs are going to be help, able to help me with because you guys were great in saying, hey, this is what this stuff can do. And if you have a problem, I've used third tier before, not to give them a plug. It was easy to do business. Now I'm seeing it's going to be a lot harder. I want to take a moment and just <laughs> applaud when you said because you're absolutely right. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, and we're three minutes over now. So I'm going to give you the mic, and then I'm going to ask you to bring the question uh, up front so we can have a conversation. But I do want to thank everybody. If you do have another session or somewhere else to be, thank you very much for coming. Please fill out your evals, but I'm getting uh, the hook from the back of the room. Okay, so the only thing that I want to correct about what you said is that you don't have to take less money and make less profit. You have to adjust your thinking on how you continue to make the money and the profit that you need. The second thing that I want to say is that this discussion will pick up almost precisely on that endpoint tomorrow morning. Cliff and I are doing a session. I think it's at 9.30. I don't know if somebody can. At 9.30 uh, in the morning, uh, which is the, the future of uh, skilled IT. That'll be in the morning. Who else has a session tomorrow? And what time's yours? End of the day, and does anybody else in here have sessions? The sun shines bright as it moves across my face. I feel the light, and everything is in its place. I woke up feeling great, today was made for me, and life is good the way it should, the way it was meant to be, and it's a beautiful day. Is blowing.